Well, hey guys, welcome back. You drew me about three or four weeks ago as I'm shaving down a piece of oak for a handle for a new hammer. And to do this, I'm using a planer, which I made earlier this year. And you know, I'm more of a metal guy, but woodworking can be so much fun sometimes. And doing this is a lot more enjoyable and easy when you have sharp tools. Which for the blade meant using a combination of diamond stones and the wet sander, which I also made earlier this year. The blade's only made from carbon steel, so it needs to stay cool whilst I'm sharpening it, otherwise it will lose its hardness. Now the inside of the sharpener is actually quite basic. It's a 775 DC motor, which is hooked up to a worm gear, which is in turn hooked up to the main shaft of the sander. It's all that basic and it's all driven by 12 volt power, which on a wet sanding rig is a good thing. Now you might expect, given the small size of the motor, that it would be hugely underpowered. But once you put it through the worm gearbox, there is actually a huge amount of torque, which is enough to drive the whetstones. From memory, this is a 40 to 1 reduction, but obviously since worm gears aren't known to be hugely efficient, I'd say we still get at least 20 times the torque out compared to what we put in. So even going by that, that is still a huge amount of torque. Now if you remember even earlier than that, to make this whole setup, I had to free hob it on the lathe using a free hobbing setup. Essentially I had to take a gear hob, which kind of looks like a gear tap except a little bit bigger, and I had to feed that into a partially machined gear and rely on the hob advancing the gear to the next tooth while also cutting the current one at the same time. Now whilst it did work, it is a bit of a hit or miss method, but those are the steps that you need to take when you need to machine non-spur gears, but you also don't have a dedicated universal milling machine and universal dividing head on hand. It's difficult, but you can do it. And at least so far, the gearbox has held up really well. I did get a few questions asking why I went to all the effort of making the gear hob and heat treating it, when instead I could have simply used a thread tap to make the gear. Now I was a bit confused at first, but as it turns out, it seems to be a bit of a viral hack for making something which is essentially what I made, except if you believe the hack, a lot easier and a lot quicker. And on face value, you know, I do get the appeal. You know, gears, even at the best of times, can be very expensive or challenging to make, so an easy method using tools that I already have in the workshop is something that I could really get invested in. But, and there's always a but, I think there are a lot of reasons why you probably wouldn't want to do this method, which don't seem to be addressed in these videos. You know, I'm not saying that this whole method is flawed, but I think it's worth knowing that you know all the facts going in before you commit to doing this method. Because what you're making is not exactly the same thing as what I was making. So I guess the best way to show you would simply be to make one. I'll be using an M10 by 1.5 tap, which is probably as small as you'd want to go. And already, we sort of have problem number one, because most of the established formulas that I work to don't work here, because all of those formulas are set up to work for module or diametral pitch gears. And thread taps aren't based on module, which itself is based on pi, you know, 3.14. And by that I mean the spacing between gear teeth is pi times the module, or the gear size. So on a module 1 gear rack, the spacing between each gear tooth is pi. And that does matter because all the formulas that I use are based on it. And because you take pi out of the equation, the pitch circle is simply the number of teeth times the module, and that gives us our pitch diameter. And for the gears that I use, that is usually a whole number. However, because we're working from pitch directly with the thread taps, the size of the gear is instead driven by the circumference, not the diameter, if that makes sense. So effectively, the circumference of the pitch circle needs to be divisible by the pitch, which is fine, except that's a longer calculation, and you usually end up having to hit some odd diameters. It's not the worst, but it is a longer and a different calculation to make, since you also have to add the addendum of the gear tooth as well. Not impossible, but it is worth mentioning. Now the next issue that I ran into isn't the fault of using a tap, but it is a bit of a pitfall of the free hopping process. And that was getting enough bite so that the gear is advanced enough to get the correct spacing for the next tooth, which it wasn't. And that's probably no surprise. I mean, this tap is so small that it's probably the equivalent of a 0.5 module. Now normally I'd simply gash the gear to help it turn, but I don't have a cutter small enough to effectively make that pattern. 
Thankfully I found a workaround, which was to simply machine in a groove. Or maybe that's make the side walls a little bit taller. And in doing that, we're effectively forming what is known as a gear throat. And all it's there to do is help extend the amount of contact between the hob and the gear. Now doing this is pretty normal for worm gears, although what I'm doing here is really exaggerated. You know, most throated gears are not this tall, but to make this pattern work, I had to make it a lot taller than I normally would. And after enough trial and error, it thankfully produced a worm-ish looking gear. Definitely ish, because the gear tooth is a lot thinner and a lot more pointed than a normal module gear. But credit where credit is due, you know, it's definitely a worm gear. It takes in a high RPM input and it slows it down by a huge margin. With that said though, I wouldn't expect it to handle as well under proper loads for extended periods of time in the same way that we would expect a normal worm drive to do. Which I think is definitely worth talking about. Now my first concern, at least compared to a normal module gear, is that there isn't a hole in the material at the end of the gear tooth. I'm sure the wear pattern is going to be a bit different, but considering that there isn't a hole in the material at the end, I'm sure those tips aren't going to last very long. And I also wouldn't bet on the ends of the gear teeth being all that strong, because again, there isn't a whole lot of material in the gear teeth. The other big thing that worries me though is the pressure angle of the gears. You know, it's going to be about 30 degrees here for a regular V-thread, which is at least 50% more than you'd normally want, which in high loads can cause us a few issues. And all pressure angle really is, is it effectively describes the normal to the tangent to the contact angle between two gear teeth. Effectively, it just describes the angle of the transfer of force between two gear teeth. And normally, it is not something that you'd have to think about because most gears these days are 20 degrees. Some older ones are 14.5, but most of the ones that I've ever seen are 20. But these are 30. Now, the increased pressure angle should result in an overall stronger gear tooth. Which does go against what I said earlier, but I do think the root of the gear tooth should be stronger. Although once again, it is a bit difficult to compare the two because not only is the pressure angle different, but the entire profile is also different. But what is true is that a higher pressure angle gear is generally stronger. And if you need strong gear teeth, that's probably a good thing, but you are going to be getting a trade-off at the expense of efficiency. Because more of the force, if you break it down into its components, will be wanting to push the two gear teeth away rather than actually wanting to turn the gear, which is what you want. Effectively, that should result in a less efficient system, in a system that's already quite rubbish in that respect. As a fallout of that, I'm also quite sure that you see a good amount of extra force going through both shafts because they now want to push each other away more than they'd already want to. Now that's probably okay with light loads, but I probably wouldn't want to run that for extended periods of time. And on top of that, I'm still skeptical of the tooth profile itself. You know, I would suspect that due to the pointy profile, there would be a bit of excessive rubbing down inside the gear tooth itself. You know, I'm no geologist, but that profile still doesn't sit all that well with me. With all that said though, I still think there is some validity to this method. You just need to know all the facts when you are going in. Because I think realistically, if you're not building some tight tolerance gearbox that is going to receive a high amount of load, and you just need to repair something quick, or you need something that you just want to get done, this method is probably okay. I mean, if the loads aren't going to be that high, or you aren't going to use it a whole lot, I don't see why you couldn't use this method. I mean, all of us have thread taps on hand, but I'm sure not all of us want to buy slash make a proper gear hob. Plus, if you have a lathe like mine that doesn't cut in module pitches, so you can't cut most worm gears to match, I don't see why this method couldn't work. Even on my setup, I wasn't able to cut a perfect worm gear. I had to settle for something very close to 0.8. But in my setup, given the lighter loads that I was expecting, this setup worked just fine. Now, if you do choose to use this method, I would still recommend that you use an Acme or a metric trapezoidal cutter. Acme cutters do produce a 14.5 degree pressure angle, which is correct for a lot of older gears, and trapezoidal should give you 15. Now the width across the flats are still going to be wrong, so you won't be producing a proper gear profile. And it's still going to be circumference driven, not diameter. But you still end up with something that's very usable. Not perfect, but if it does fit within the constraints of your design, I don't see why something like this wouldn't work, at least in a pinch. And if that's all you need, I don't see why it wouldn't work.
And that's about it for this week. I hope you enjoyed this video. Thank you very much for watching. See you next week.